I'll leave it to you, Jacopo. Thank you. Good afternoon to all. Do you hear me? Yeah, because I don't know if this is working. Okay. So, uh, well, thanks to Michael and to Train for the invitation. It's really a pleasure to be here. What I will um, present to you today is a very short um, version of what is actually my PhD thesis, which I just finished, I just delivered at the um, FAO, Facultà di Architecture and Urbanism uh, University in Sao Paulo. And before getting really into the theme of the presentation, I would like to stress one thing that Michael just said very shortly, is that the presentation I'm, I'm doing today is not really a lecture, it's not a reading, it's more of a talk, so an informal talk, and reflects in a way what I do as a, as a curator. I consider myself much more a curator than an art critic, so what I'll show you today is really a group of artworks that together make sense to me, and this is the way I usually organize my, my exhibition. So the fact that it's informal also um, allows all of you, I would like to allow all of you to make interventions, not just at the end of the presentation, but also in the middle of it, if you feel like you have doubts or questions or things that you would like to say. And um, so, as you probably know from, from the title of, of the talk, I will, just, I will discuss the way uh, the walking, or just the walking, as Francis Ali said. This is, on, on the left, what you see is a note by Francis Ali, in fact, uh, for a piece that he did in New York in 2001 that we will see later on. Um, the way this becomes the actual material of the artwork. Even to professionals who work in, who work in the artwork, I notice that it comes often as a, as a surprise to see how many work, or how many artists actually use this strategy, this medium, so to say, for, for, uh, to create their, their work. In the PhD I told you about, I list more than 250 works that actually deal with this theme from the end of the 60s until today, more or less. Of course, today we will see much less. And mostly, although not, um, not only, works that are more recent. Not from, and there are a few works from the end of the 60s that I will show, but most of them are from the last two decades, more or less. So as a brief introduction, uh, I have to say that the, the, the idea of the drift as an artistic practice has historical uh, precedents that, that mounts back to the surrealist groups and to Dada, but what I will base my, my presentation on today is more of the, um, on the international situationist, the situationist theorist, Guy Debord especially, who, not just because they were very important, of course, uh, especially the theory of the derive, the text the board wrote in 1958 is very relevant in this context, but mostly because all the issues, all the reasons why the situationists um, theorized the derive as an important strategy, also a revolutionary strategy, as they said, are still valid in my, from my point of view to what happens today, to the, to the works that today use the act of walking. So, uh, the board in his text started by saying that one of the basic situationist practices is the derive. I, I won't traduce derive, the, the, tr the translation would, pre would be drift, although I've found in the internet a few English texts that would prefer not to translate it because derive is more, I think, more of an open word than drift. So it's, I'm, I'm using a, an English translation that doesn't translate derive into drift. So the, one of the basic situationist practices is the derive, a technique of rapid passage through varied ambiences. Derives involve playful, constructive behavior and awareness of psychogeographical effects and are though quite different from the classic mo notions of journeys or stroll. The board then uh, goes on by saying that the, the reef consists on wandering, mainly on foot, but eventually by other means, choosing on the spot and randomly the way to go. And he also emphasizes the mainly urban nature of the derive and the fact that one can drift alone, but to do it with others in small groups of two or three people is more reward rewarding. Um, through the technique of the derive, the situationists wanted to introduce a completely different way of looking and understanding the city. Uh, and delving into its, its nature that they consider to be very mysterious in a way. And what is probably more interesting is the fact that the situationists, uh, they adopted the practice of, of the derive, as I said, in a very contemporary way, as a direct way of addressing some key issues of the capitalist society, and more specifically, 
of what the board himself in a later book would call the society of the spectacle, which I think all of you are very familiar with. Uh, for example, by choosing to go on foot and therefore slowly if compared to driving a car or using any other mechanical means, and without any tangible destination, without any clear goal, they emphasized and they're very clear on that, um, how much they oppose the capitalist uh, focus and objective idea of movement as the fastest way of getting from one place to another. So in a society where time is money, it was time already, uh, it was, that was the way the capitalistic society already looked at time at, uh, in 1950s, the gap between the two places where one wants or needs to be has to be sh as short as possible. And the situationists opposed to that um, though uh, hinting at a different society where values are completely different and certainly not regulated by money or time effectiveness. At the same time, um, the derives uh, in all the works that we'll see and very clearly in the situationist theory oppose the idea of a society of, spe of, of the spectacle because what they want, the situationist through the derive and also many of those artists, is that they're not just watching, they're acting. So the, the fact that their physical acts is uh, what turns the, the artist a revolutionary in the sense that it doesn't agree to being just somebody watching the society of the spectacle, but he acts, he does something. Um, by creating an artistic practice that basically only exists as a physical and personal act and that cannot be commoditized nor replicated, this is another thing, they're not, they're not creating objects that can be commoditized. commoditized. The situationists and the rest of the artists that we'll see today, they object to all of this. So um, I will focus on works produced in the last few decades, but I thought it was important to, to introduce the situationist experience, as most of these issues that I just mentioned will, will come again. Um, since I've been revolving around these ideas for the last five years for my PhD, I, I think there are almost countless ways of looking at these works. I mean, we could, going back to the idea of these being some kind of curatorship, you could look at these works from different angles. And there are several ways these works could be read. So what I did today was I divided the group, the works that I wanted to show you in three main chapters, so to say, three main groups. Uh, which are one step away from literature that revolves around the idea of the close relationship between many of those works and literature. The opposite of the derive, which is sort of an intermezzo between the two main groups and which shows works that theoretically are just the opposite of what the board considered a derive. And finally creating nothing on the idea of works that don't aim at create anything or often do aim at create a void, the nothing. Um, as I said, though, it, it is important to keep in mind that most of the works of any of those groups could actually fit into the other ones. So this is something I'm, I'm not going to point at you all the time, but I think it adds uh, to the way you, you look at those works. Yeah? So this is just a, a picture of the Situationists in 1957 when they were in, in, in Italy, I think, this, this image. So this is the first group, one step away from literature. Um, this is a quote by Borges, Argentinian writer. The steps a man takes from the day of his birth to the day of his death trace an inconceivable, inconceivable figure in time. The divine intelligence perceives that figure at once as man's intelligence perceives a triangle. That figure, perhaps, as its determined function in the economy of the universe. Um, so the groups that, are, uh, that I show you here relate to the idea of, of, of being close to literature. And it could be said that contemporary art, if compared to previous moments in art history, are not really interested uh, or not so interested as other periods in creating narratives and counting stories, at least not in conventional way. And more often they try to create an atmosphere or a situation. And it's funny to see how the derives, though, uh, probably due to their very nature, which is the fact that they don't aim at creating an object, and also the act that takes place is necessarily not an, ob an act that can be justified uh, in the sense that it has an, uh, an objective or a goal. Uh, they often create a situation where a story is recounted. M often it's just the fact 
the act that actually takes place that is recounted, whether through some recording of it or actually being written. And this way, the work becomes understandable, or at least it becomes knowable. So this is the first work I wanted to show you. It's a work you probably are familiar with, it's with it's because it's a very famous work. This is Vito Acconci's following pieces, a work by 1969. Uh, I guess you all know it, but anyway, during 23 days, Aconchi chose randomly in the street people he would follow, and then he would follow them either for a few minutes until they vanished somewhere or for several hours during the whole day. So um, this is a very important piece to begin with because Aconchi began actually as a poet, so, so the relation with literature is very present in his work. And this is actually one of the work that marks the shift from his uh, poetry activity to the um, more art-related works, in the sense that these pieces were intended as a way for him to gather material for his writings. So the piece is actually the writing and not what you're seeing. Actually this image, uh, it was later proved that this image is a stage image. This is not really one of the following pieces. And this is an issue that I'm not going to really go into today, but I want you to keep in mind. So. All the images that we see are in a way contradictory because if we said that what matters in a derive is the act and the fact of physically taking place into an action and not showing it or looking at it, the recording of it is in itself uh, a delicate issue. And this uh, summarizes it in a way because these pictures, as I said, were staged. What Aconci actually did was to follow people, a different one every day, and then to write um, a very poetical account of that, and then he would send those writings to uh, other persons from, from the art world in New York and, and around. So they are actually, the pieces are actually literature, beside being an act. Uh, and also, this is an, a very good work to begin with, because to start this group with, because it generated uh, other works that took place in, in, in later times that are actually very, very closely related to, uh, similar to this one, although not always this precedent is um, acknowledged, so to say. And this is something that we will see that o often happens. This is a piece by Francis Alice. It's actually a series of works that he's been doing um, since 1998, and he still does. There is a text that he wrote on this, and it's, it says, when arriving in a new city, wander, looking for someone who could be you. If the meeting happens, walk beside your doppelganger until your pace adjusts to his or hers. If not, repeat the quest in the next city. So you can see it relates very closely to uh, Aconci, although there is a difference, that, which is that Francis Alice is doing this in cities he doesn't know, where he gets there for the first time, while Aconci was doing this in his own, in his own town, New York. And then there is another work, very, very uh, famous, I think many of you know it, which is called Suite Venitienne. Suite Venitienne is, is a piece by 1980, yeah, by Sophie Cal, the French artist. And she said that, she wrote that, for months I followed strangers on the street. So the same activity that we mentioned before. And actually there is a funny story which says that after actually, uh, after Sophie Cal had already done this series, somebody told her of Vito Acconci's work that she didn't know. So she actually flew to New York to talk to him, and Acconci said, okay, you can do it, it's okay, I don't mind. <laughs> More or less like that. But then this piece, Sweet Venetienne, uh, she said, for months I followed strangers on the street for the pleasure of following them, not because they particularly interested me. I photographed them without their knowledge, took note of their movement, then finally lost sight of them and forgot them. At the end of January 1980, on the streets of Paris, I followed a man whom I lost sight of a few minutes later in the crowd. That very evening, quite by chance, he was introduced to me at an opening. During the course of our conversation, he told me he was planning an imminent trip to Venice. This is how the recounting, once again, almost literature, you know, this, this beginning very poetic, it's almost literature, the recounting that Sophie Kahl does of the whole event and of, of how the piece started, um, introduces in a way this literature, this literary universe. And then we have an, another work which also very closely reminds of Vito Conci. This is Francesco Iodice, an Italian artist, and the work is called Secret Traces. And what he did here was 
sort of in the middle between uh, Francis Alice and uh, Vito Acconci, he got in touch with people in other cities where he had never been before, and he advised them or informed them and asked authorization to follow them. So the people would know, they, they knew they would be followed, but they didn't know when. And this was, although he didn't acknowledge the, the, um, the president, neither of Vito Conci or Francis Alice, who actually started the doppelganger more or less in the same time, was, uh, in, in the artist's world, was actually a way to get to know the town. So it's very similar to what Francis Alice was doing. And he wanted to get to know the town through the movement in it of somebody who actually lived there. A different work that actually um, invites not, or is not a recounting of what the, the artist did, but it's an invitation to, to, to the public to do that, is Janet, Janet Cardiff. This one is Drogon's Nightmare. I, I chose this one because it's from 98 as well, so the same year again. But actually this is part of a bigger series you might, or I hope some of you are familiar with, because it's a really amazing series of walk. It's called The Walks, actually. And they, they function this way. You get um, a Walkman, a CD Walkman, and you put it on your ear. And then a voice, which is usually her voice, starts to, to talk to you. And she tells you what you're supposed to do. So she tells you to walk, usually outside of the building, and she leads you for, for a walk that usually takes like 15 minutes, 20 minutes, half an hour. And throughout this walk, she once again recounts a story, which is very, very literary, as most of her works are. But what is amazing here is that what takes place is actually exactly what Francis Alice tells, to do, tells the visitor in a new city to do. Because she usually starts, when she first starts talking, and then she starts walking. And when she walks, you can hear very clearly her heels on the floor. So she, in, she says, she invites you to adjust your pace to her pace. And this is fundamental because if you don't do that, you won't be at the place she's talking about at the time she's talking about it. So when she stops, you have to stop. And when she starts walking again, you have to start walking again. So it's exactly what, what Alice is telling us to do. And it's, these are fascinating pieces. I didn't really do this one. I did another one in Munster in the Sculpture Project. I don't know if any of you had been there. It's really amazing because Munster is a typical small German city. You have bicycles, bicycles going around all the time. So she says, now cross the street, watch out for the bicycle. And there's a bicycle going through the, every time. It's amazing. It's really amazing. And finally, um, this other work by Sophie Kahl, uh, which is called La Filature, is from 1981. And in this work, what she did Sophie Kahl asked her mother to hire a private detective, and the private detective followed her for several days. And in this case, instead of being the artist, um, it was the private detective who was writing and describing what was happening. So it's sort of uh, uh, the opposite of what Aconci might, might do, for example. And it's fascinating, and it's important, of course, to, to talk about Sophie Kahl in a... In a in this group of, of works that relate very closely to literature because uh, in fact the artist herself became the protagonist of a book by Paul Oster entitled Leviathan. Uh, in this book there is a character with, whose name is Maria and this Maria follows strangers to photograph them and is uh, Oster admitted that it was based actually on Sophie Kahl. And even more interestingly, a few years later Sophie Kahl asked Paul Oster to write uh, about a character that would be an artist and uh, that would perf perform the works that Sophie Kahl hadn't performed yet. And then eventually Sophie Kahl actually did the work that Oster described before her. And this is now uh, in a book called Gotham Handbook, if you're interested to, to, to look it up. It's a very interesting book. So it's, it, it's an interesting thing how many of these works that you just saw revolve around the idea of the artist as a follower or more specifically, like this work and other works, a detective. So um, a detective that is following somebody or is being followed. On the other hand, um, in some cases, the strategy is the opposite to that. And in, in a sense, more similar to the, the idea of Borges that I mentioned at the beginning, of a figure, of an imaginary figure that by walking is, is created. And a good example of this, um, although not, not artistic but literary, 
is actually in a book by Paul Oster, another book, The Trilogy of New York. It's, it's a group of three small novels, and one of them is City of Glass, uh, where the, the detective actually follows the other guy, and there is a, a mixing and interchanging of roles in, in the whole book, which is very fascinating if you think of Sophie Kahl. Um, and he actually understands that the movement that the person he is following are writing on a map the letters that make up the phrase the Tower of Babel. So this is a reference, a literary reference to this work, but then there are artistic reference of, of this idea of something that is a drawing on the city made by walking. This is another work by Francis Alice, Fairy Tales in 1995, which is obviously interesting here because A, it points to the idea of literature once again, the idea of the work being a fairy tale, and B, uh, it is a work that, I mean, it's very clear from this image. He, he from his jersey, he, he pulled uh, a part of this rope, a thread of the rope, and he just made a, a knot to a nail and just start walking, and, and the, the jersey would just un, undo it, undo itself. And then eventually when he came back, he, pulling it up, he found the lady who was pulling it up and already had made up a story about the whole thing. But this is something different. What I mean is that here, he is in a way drawing an imaginary figure like the one Borges is talking about on, on, on the town, no? in a way. Um, so this is so much for the idea of the fairy tale. And also, there is a nice uh, work by Francis Alice, which I don't have here, but if you want to see it, you just have to cross the street. It's a Tate Gallery, it's a video. I don't know if you've seen it. Uh, it's called Pacing. I think it's called Pacing. In, in this work, what it does uh, is to, he has a stick in his hand and it just goes on, on iron bars all around the town. And what it does is he makes a song out of it. And this relates to the idea of counting and creating um, and the way walking is a way of counting and, and measuring the word. And this is what also happens in this work. Now, this is called pacing. I'm not sure about the title of the other one here at, at Tate. But this one is actually drawing. This one is the work that actually he realized based on, on, the, on the writing at the beginning of the lecture that I show you where he said just a walking from west to south and north to east and so on. So this is actually his uh, itinerary in New York and it's, you cannot really see it but he counted the number of steps that he, go, that he took in every direction. So this is really a way of counting the word by walking. And it relates very closely, although I don't, I'm not sure he, he acknowledged that, to what conceptual artist Stanley Brown, Dutch artist, did in the 60s and 70s. He did a whole series of, of works that was actually just about counting his steps in Germany, in Switzerland, in Italy, in a lot of different places. And finally, to end this first chapter with the idea of walking and drawing by walking, I wanted to show you this work, which is, um, if not the, the newest work I will show, which I'm not sure of, not sure of, it's probably the most technological one. This is a Finnish artist, Antti Leitinen. This work is actually a series of work, because it's called Walk the Line. So what he did, he walked with a GPS in several towns, or in several different places, and then superimposed those different walks. And obviously, when he was walking, he was trying to make his self-portrait. So he was actually drawing with the GPS, and then he printed the, 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 his itinerary with the GPS, and by superimposing it, it actually gets quite close to, to his own portrait. So it's, it's an interesting way of um, summarizing the idea of, of drawing by walking. So. This second chapter, as I said, is more of a, an intermezzo in the sense that it's um, also a joke in a way because what I'll show you here are works that deal very closely with the themes we're talking about and that's why they're interesting on, from my point of view. And they make total sense uh, with the idea of the derive, of the drift. 
but they are work that in a way are the opposite of what uh, the board and not just the board anybody could consider a drift this is a work by Marcius Galan a Brazilian artist it's a performance that he did in 2002 and uh, it's a collage of, of stills actually from a small video that he did what he did here it, it was a very long performance he um, he had this machine that was creating a, a string, is that how you call it, from the shoe, to tie a shoe? Shoelace. Shoelace, okay. Th this machine creates a shoelace. So he was actually walking away from the machine, uh, the distance that the machine allowed him, in a way, to say. So the, the performance lasted a few hours, and in these few hours he was able to walk, I don't know, a few hundred meters, because the shoelace got bigger and bigger and bigger, so he could get away in a way, from the gallery was where the machine was creating the shoelace. But of course, the, the most important work in, in, in the idea of, the, of a walking work, which is actually the opposite of the, of the derive, it's this one, also a work I'm sure you're all familiar with. Uh, this is Richard Long's A Line Made by Walking, which is what the title says. Tautology is also a very important issue in most of this work. So he walks, he walked, back and forth several times until the, the grass was down and he could photograph this line. So, um, as I said, this is in a way the opposite of the, of the reef because as we saw before, the board suggested that the reef was done in small groups and this was done alone. Uh, he repeatedly walking a straight line, so he was not allowed any detournement, any detour. And it is in a field, so it's not in a urban environment. So basically, it contradicts all of the board's uh, predicaments of a derive. On the other hand, though, if you think about it, it points to the same core issues as it points to the need or to the wish of not creating any sellable art, of just doing an action which is ephemeral and it, that doesn't bring anything else beside what you see. And it's a very physical act, so he's actually doing it. And I would say that the fact of doing it alone is actually makes it actually more relevant either than making it together, as the board suggested. Um, so there are all the issues that are actually typical or fundamental in the in the idea of the derive are also very present here, although this work should, is not actually a derive. And and interestingly enough, like a conscious following pieces have generated or resonated in, in, in a lot of later works, this work actually is present in, in what contemporary <coughs> artists are doing. This is a video by another Brazilian artist, André Comazzo. This, it's called in English, West, or Until the, Where the Sun Can Get. And what he did here, he was walking, uh, always following the West, and trying to go over all the obstacles and uh, the um, impediments that, that the city inevitably, of course, creates. So it was a struggle to, to keep this west direction against the city, which obviously he failed to do. And then this is a video. The, the video just stops every time he has an obstacle he cannot go over. And uh, an English artist actually did a very similar piece. Simon Faithful is, this is a piece from 2010, so very recent. And uh, as it said in the press release of the exhibition, it, it says, this is an ambitious undertaking in which the artist sets out to walk, climb, wait, and swim his way across the whole land of the United Kingdom, from the English Channel to the North Sea, keeping strictly to the Greenwich Meridian, the zero longitude point from which all international navigation is calculated. Um, so it's, once again, it's basically the same work, and it's basically going straight and alone, and not doing anything tangible that you can actually hold on to. So the ideas, the principles are the same. And one important thing is that this work was shown, I think it was done for an exhibition that was called Going Nowhere, which is interesting as I will see right now why. And then I wanted to show you other works that are also the opposite of the derive, although in a completely different way. Uh, this, for instance, it's also a very famous work. You might know it. It's Sildo Mereles. Sildo Mereles is another Brazilian artist. Uh, Insertion in Ideological Circuits. It's a series of works that he did in the 70s. 
This one was with uh, um, Coca-Cola bottles, then he did other with uh, banknotes. It's a group, it's a series of work. What he did, he did writings on, on, the, on, the, on the bottles that were against uh, colonialization and very political uh, charged writings. And what he did, he, he did the writing in white on, on the empty bottle so you could not actually see it and when the bottle got filled up again these writings would become visible but then it was too late in a sense because the bottles were again circulating and so this message was spreading. So although this is also the opposite of the derive as you can uh, understand uh, clearly it does relate in a way to all these ideas we're talking about because it was a work uh, done to circulate almost in an anonymous way and it was done to um, oppose the society both in this example very clearly both the capitalistic society and the repressive society and it was done by using a movement so not really a derive but the fact of a movement that takes place in completely randomly way and probably exactly because it is random and it is not expected it is so ex effective and another wor work that is related to Sildos is Eugenio Ditburn, a Chilean artist who has been doing this pinturas aeropostales, so air uh, painting, so to say, from the 1980s. And he began doing this to, uh, to create a way of escaping, actually, uh, the dictatorship, Pinochet dictatorship in, in Chile, because he knew that all artistic um, products were subject to, to a very strict censorship, but if it would just send by a normal mail the, the work, it would just go through. So what he does, he always shows the painting together with the envelope he'd actually traveled in. So you can see it on the right hand side of, of each of the painting, there is always the envelope it was shipped with. So this is something that today is not uh, necessarily so politically charged as it was when he began doing, the, doing it. But it's, it is, of course, another work that deals with the idea of movement and that somehow um, I thought it fit into this presentation here. So the last uh, group of works that I will show uh, revolve around the idea of creating nothing, which is uh, an important issue in, in, in the... Um, in the practice of the derive, in the fact that, in the sense that they don't aim at creating an object, and more specifically, as we as we will see, they aim often at creating a void in a way. So this is a, a quote by Susan Sontag, 1969: "A new element enters the artwork and becomes constitutive of it. The appeal, tacit or overt, for its own abolition, and ultimately for the abolition of art itself." Um, I will begin this. Um, group of works with another work by Francis Alice, it's not by chance. I mean, Francis Alice is the artist who today uses the, the act of walking more in a more systematic way, as you know, probably. This is one of his most famous pieces, I think, Paradox of Praxis, which has a subtitle that, is, that says, Sometime doing something brings to doing to nothing. And it's a piece from <coughs> 1997. And what he did here, uh, as it is very clear, this is there is a small video, actually, if you look at it in, in, on YouTube, you will see it. But what he did, he took this ice block, which is, interestingly enough, a very pure form, almost a moder modern form, and then he pushes it through uh, Mexico City until it just vanishes completely. And this idea of a physical effort is very present here, and also the idea of uh, the desire to create not an object but a void is very clearly summarized here. And in fact, um, what Alice described, what, what Alice said about this work and other works is that um, the artist, uh, that is a very important thing in Latin America to work with an indeterminate state of things. So things are always somehow dissolving in a way. And another thing that he, he relates very clearly to the politics of, of, to the political conditions of Latin America is what he called the politics of rehearsal, which is another recurrent theme in his, in his work, and which could be related to other works that we saw before, and also considered the opposite of the derive, because if you think about uh, a rehearsal as uh, a, ten, uh, um, a training to do something, 
it goes completely on the opposite of what the situation is, with emphasis on, on random and chance we're, we're suggesting. Um, so this work is called The Rehearsal, and it's, it's a very nice uh, video. I don't know if you've seen it. it what you see is this uh, Volkswagen Beetle. It goes up and, and then comes down again uh, for, for the whole video. And the, the soundtrack is a group of danson, a typical Mexican music, that is rehearsing. So what, did, what happens is that they start rehearsing, and when they start rehearsing, the, the Volkswagen starts going up. And as soon as one of them loses track and they have to stop, the car just comes back again. So it goes and comes back again, goes and comes back again. So it's very clearly, and, and he actually describes it quite well, that it's not going anywhere. It's creating a void, like I say, creating nothing in the sense that it's just an infinite repetition. It's, it is in a way a rehearsal, but it is in a way also almost a Sisyphus effort of just, you know, bringing the stone up and then it would just eventually fall down again. And this brings me back to this work, which is a line made by walking, because this was also a, a rehearsal. The idea of the rehearsal is very present here, and the idea of not creating nothing, because of creating nothing, because as you can imagine, when after he took the picture, the grass would eventually, in a few days or whatever, ra ra raise again, and um, and the work would be actually invisible. And on this work. Uh, there is actually a statement that, he, that uh, Richard Long gave, which says, my first, work, my first work made by walking in 1967 was a straight line in a grass field, which was also my own path, my own path going nowhere. And this is interesting, because if you think that this work is from 67, and then Simon Faithful exhibition that we saw before was entitled exactly Going Nowhere. So it's the same title, and it's the same emphasis on the idea of not creating anything or going nowhere. Now, I'm just going to make a small detour, to use another situationist term, um, which is around the idea of, of boredom. Because summarizing a little bit the, the, the um, situationist theories, uh, as I said, the derive and other strategies that proposed were, in their view, a way of turning people from actors uh, from, from, from spectators into actors. And this opposed or was a way of uh, escaping the society of the spectacles and of escaping the boredom that actually the society was creating. And uh, in their view, the, the um, derive and other strategies they proposed would be able to transform everybody's everyday life into sequences of, of surprises and emotions and delving people into the unexpected and to what uh, would actually become what they called a urban transformation uh, in the end. On the other hand, and this is what I'm suggesting here, not, it's not a situationist uh, theory, if you want to fight a society of spectacle, it could be argued that the most effective works would be work that are actually boring and not the most interesting ones. Because what the Society of Spectacle is proposing is to be all the time very interesting and very fascinating and always proposing in new surprises. So it's, I think it's fascinating to see how this idea of boredom, of course I'm using a term which is very specific, but I think boredom uh, involves several different ideas uh, or themes. Um, so this work, the fact that these works could be considered in a way boring in doing them, like here, walking back and forth several times in a grass field, or, or by looking at them, uh, it's, from my point of view, very interesting. So the very idea of repetition, of not having a culminating moment or an image that summarizes the action, which is another thing that happens, because this derive in basically all the cases don't have uh, a culminating moment. Nothing ever happens. They just go on and on until they stop. Uh, all this um, somehow relates to the idea of boredom, of not being exciting in, in a way. And in fact, um, the very idea of the, um, the dematerialization of art, which is a theme that was strongly debated in the end of 60s and beginning of 70s, um, and was 
a time where several works like this were produced, uh, deals very closely to, to the time when, uh, relates very closely to the time when the Derive started to consolidate as an artistic practice. So we have a few precedents, historical ones that I wanted to show. This is a Dada uh, advertisement of the opening of the big Dada season. And what they did for this um, date, on this date, was to organize what is probably the first derive in artistic history, at least the oldest one I got hold of. What they did was they organized a visit to what they called the most banal places in Paris. So you see the idea of boredom, of not being interesting, was already very present at that time. Another action that they did, they would open a Larousse dictionary and just read out loud the words. So again, the idea of tautology that I mentioned before was very present already at that time. And to name just a few more contemporary, more recent works, this is Robert Rauschenberg's white painting. This is, uh, from my point of view, one of the seminal works in, in around the 50s, not just from my point of view, together with John Cage, 4 minute 33, uh, which is the following year. And these are works that could be considered, once again, the opposite of what could be exciting. Nothing happens on, on the white paintings if you don't know how to look at them, and nothing happens in, in 4 minutes 33 seconds by John Cage if you, if you don't know how to hear what is going on. So these are works that point to this idea of boredom in a way. And this is uh, another work which I think sort of summarizes what I'm trying to say. In, in an even more obvious way. This is also by Robert Rauschenberg, the erased the Kooning drawing. What he did here, I'm sure you all know, he went to the Kooning and said, I would like to erase a work of yours as an artwork. He had been, done, he had been doing that before with his own drawings, but he thought it was not really very strong. So he went to the Kooning, the Kooning selected a drawing, a special one. The Kooning had three kinds of drawing. The bad ones, the good ones, and the special ones. The special ones were not just pencil, they were mixed technique. Uh, so he gave him a special one because he knew it wouldn't be so easy to erase it. And it actually took a few weeks to the Koenig to erase it. But what, the reason why I'm showing this is that although it might seem we are a bit off track from the idea of walking, uh, I think that this idea of painstakingly creating a void, creating the nothing, relates very closely to the idea of the derive. And in fact, um, it was very fascinating for me to discover during the, my researches for the PhD that Bastian Ader, who is a Dutch artist who, who disappeared actually at sea in 1965 during this, the creation, the, the production of this work, um, actually this work, it, it was supposed to be a trilogy. First a derive in Los Angeles, then the sailing, solitary once again, sailing of the ocean, and then another derive adrift in Amsterdam, where he, where he originally came from. And what happened is that it disappeared at sea while crossing the ocean. So this is obviously a very, very symbolic, strong work in, in a discussion on how the derive are a way of creating nothing and of disappearing, even beyond the artist's intention. But what is fascinating is that um, in a video, very beautiful video on Bastian Ader, I found out that while he was still studying at the Rietveld Academy in, in uh, Amsterdam, he actually used the same sheet of paper a whole year, making notes and then erasing them, making notes and erasing them. So exactly what Rauschenberg had done with the Kooning drawing. So you see that the idea of creating nothing and then making an effort to do something and then just making it disappear was already very present and it's very, there is a very close relation between what artists that are not really into walking did and what, at least conceptually, and what these artists did. Um, one of the other reasons why I think this work is very fascinating is that it combines a very conceptual approach, the, the walk, the derives are in a sense very conceptual works, despite the fact that they're very physical, and a romantic longing for a, for a sublime experience, which was Bastian Ader was all the time looking for. Uh, so it sort of brings together two 
apparently at least opposed approaches to life and to art. And this is the characteristic, I would say, of many, uh, many derived, many walking pieces, especially those who, that involve an endurance in a way. This is another very famous piece, was the last piece that Marina Abramovic and Ulai did together in 1988, when they were, you probably know, they, they did uh, throughout the 70s and 80s a lot of works together as a couple in work and life. And then in 1988 they decided to split. And what they did, they did this last great uh, performance. One, uh, Marina started walking on one side and Ulai on the other side of the Great, uh, the great Walk, uh, the Great Wall in China, and then they uh, met in the middle and they separated for good. So this is another work that involves a very, very uh, strong physical effort. But on the other hand, is a very poetical and almost utopian work in a way. And the last work I want to show you is a work, once again, by Francis Alice, um, which is called When Fate Moves Mountains. I don't know if you've seen this video. This has also been seen quite a lot. What happened here was uh, Alice was invited to participate in the um, Biennale uh, in Lima, in Peru. And it, he, he conceived of this uh, beautiful action, which is actually a very symbolic one. What, the, what he did, he called um, volunteers to move a huge sand dune. This is a sand dune, like many others, that is almost uh, swallowing part of the outskirts of, of Lima, actually a satellite city. So what he did, he called hundreds of people who would just uh, start, do a line at the bottom of the dune and start shoveling and all together they would symbolically but also physically move the dune over like a few centimeters. So the action actually took place and there is a beautiful video that shows how for all the people who participated, not all, at least the ones they, <laughs> they interviewed, it was a very symbolic and strong experience to participate in. So once again it is the act of walking, the act of doing something physical, but it points at something that is actually beyond. So this is why I, I wanted to, to close this presentation with that, because as I said, it is sublime, romantic, it is utopian, and at the same time it's very physical. Um, on the other hand, it has a goal, which is which might look in a way different from the rest of the, or many of the works that we've, we've seen before, but it's clearly, if you want to look at it that way, a completely useless goal, because to move the dune of five centimeters or ten centimeters is not going to change anybody's life. On the other hand, um, it is the opposite of a, the Bordian and the Reef, as it happens on a straight line. It, it involves a very big group of people, and it's not really what we would call a urban environment. It doesn't create a physical object, but it does create or su and succeeds from, from what we hear in, from the interviews in creating a new society or at least bringing its participants to look at society in a different way, to look at their environment in a different way. So in a sense I think that it's a good conclusion to, to this group of works because it points out how moving both of the artists, of the participant, of the viewers can be a way of by not creating necessarily an art object, uh, suggesting, suggesting that new society, new forms of art, and new way of living are possible. Thank you. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll interrupt you because I don't know if you know the story of, of Four Days, Four Nights. I don't know if any, uh, all of, Probably most of you don't know it. It's Arthur Barrio is a Brazilian, actually Portuguese-born Brazilian artist, very active in the end of the 60s until today. He did performances. And what he did in this work that Michael is talking about, he just walked uh, for, a few, for four days and four nights. And he was on drugs some of the time, not all of the time, but it was a completely hallucinatory experience. And actually, it's very interesting that you ask me in, in the way you asked me about, and then it's my question if you know the story. When, when he ended the performance, he wrote, I will do a 400 pages account of this. 
And then what he produced was his only white caderno objeto. Caderno objeto are the books that he actually did of all these performances. These are both, they're, they're actually objects that are both the result of the performance and often sketches and notes that prepare the performance. And actually this is the only white one. So your question is perfect because this was one of the other chapters that I didn't include today. Because actually that relates very closely to the what I, what I mentioned very briefly before, the contradictory nature of all of these recordings. I think there are a few artists, Stanley Brown, who I mentioned is one of them, uh, Arthur Barrio in this specific case is another one of them, who are the only artists who are very coherent, are coherent to the bottom of it, I would say. They don't make, uh, Barrio, I'm, I'm sure he fought with that. He actually perceived that it was impossible to make an account of something that he experienced, experienced in first person. And he didn't want, it's very clear to me, that he didn't want to do a simulacrum of that. Because you cannot really turn a personal, physical act into a piece of literature. Thank you so much for your presentation. I was very interested because um, I've been looking a lot at the Situationist and in the, in the Derive in, in my own PhD that I mm -hmm. finished um, not too long ago, just uh, last year. And as an artist, I was looking at the Derive in the context of um, a contested territory, sort of a, the divided city of Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. and what it meant to sort of walk in a city that has all these kinds of limitations that are psychological, physical, and, and so it's really interesting for me the examples you were giving on how certain artists were not only used the derive or drifting as a sort of strategy, but also how they ended up recording that moment. Because in how I, how, how I dealt with it, was very much that in a space where things are disappearing, the object became quite important to kind of record a time that will never be because the, the city's um, sort of like a whole people's imagination of it is being sort of under attack. Mm -hmm. So the idea of that white painting that you showed of how things come to sort of a, a place of void or um, it was quite, I, I liked very much how you were looking at the derive in that way, because <laughs> it, it kind of gave me a whole other um, um, idea of, of how, how, um, how looking at a walk could lead to kind of nothingness. So just a comment, actually, not really a question, but just interesting how you divided Thanks. it into chapters. There are interesting works that were done, actually, by walking through the border. You know that. I know, so, yeah, some of them. And actually, yeah. you did mention when the, because you've mentioned Francis Elise a lot, but he had done that green line yes. with, the, with the paint in two different cities. Yes. And one of Well, he'd done that in several cities, but the crossing borders, it's a very specific one. Mm. And then at least Emily Jassir's work yes. are very, very important in that context. Yeah. The one where she crosses a, a, a checkpoint, mm -hmm. that's a very good one. Yeah. And there's another work actually which I wanted to include today, but it would have been too much, which is a piece by uh, an Italian group, Multiplicity. Do you know this work? No, I, I'm not. This is beautiful. It's, it's actually two videos. It was shown at the Venice Biennial. Do you remember this one? It was two um, real-time mm, films, videos, of going from the same place to, I mean, from, from going from one place to the other. But one, they were traveling in the car with a person with a Palestinian passport, and in the other with the, an Israeli passport. And one took half an hour, and the other took five hours. It was amazing. It just doesn't lead to nowhere, you know, it's the same thing. It, the, where they're going is not the issue, but the fact that one takes so much longer for no reason at all was very clear and very strong, you know. Because it kind of, actually it produces like a very different narrative, a very different story. Completely, yeah, So yeah. you were linking it to literature, which I, I got quite interested in the idea of experimental writing in the, pro, like how Derive could pro, kind of produce for each person a whole different kind of narrative. Yeah. So, I mean, thank you. Thanks for that. That was a terrific presentation. It gave me a lot to think about. 
Um, I had two questions. They're really unrelated. The first one was, can, could you put in something like Ai Weiwei's dropping the Ming vase, uh, the Ming, you know, when he, he drops the Ming vase and crashes it um, within well, something like could. that? <laughs> I mean, I don't know. And, I think and, what you could put is the work that he did at Tate, where you were supposed to walk on it. Right. That, that is a very strong piece, if you want, because by the act of walking and crashing it, you would yeah. really feel you know, the power of the society you are part of. So that, was a, that is a piece that actually is in my PhD, because I think that is a very strong one, where the act of walking makes you, uh, how do you say, accomplice of, you know, of a crime, in a yeah. way. Yeah, oh, that's, that's, oh, thanks. Yeah. And the other question I had was actually about um, productivity. And I was, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the, the ways in which, well, is it possible to have productive practice that doesn't enter back into the circuit of capital? Because um, I've been thinking a lot of this. I work on, on yeah, well, that's, Roma. You know, one of the, yeah. the key uh, books, once again, I'm sure you all know it, is um, Seven Years, uh, The Dematerialization of, of, of the Artwork, Lucy Lippert, yeah, 73. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In, in, there is a, not a preface, a postface in that book, mm -hmm. when she talks that at the time those works were produced, the work that really took dematerialization as their core issue, uh, it seemed impossible that those very artists in a few years would be showing, she says that exactly that, showing and even more surprisingly selling works in the main galleries in Europe and the United States and so on. So at that time, and I think this is something that goes on, uh, artists do artworks believing that this is not going to be swallowed by the, the market or by the, the capital society if you want, but very, very seldom that happens. You might go on, you might go so far as to say that the only work that succeed in that, we don't know of. Mm. It might be, you know. Like Stanley Brown, who I mentioned before, is not so well known, basically because he never accepted that recording of what he was doing were done. I mean, in some of his performance, like the This Way Brown, the drawing, the work was the drawing, so it's there. But he did a lot of performances he made no recording of. And I think, from one point of view, this is the only coherent way of dealing with that. Like Artur Barrio, he, he was not able to produce a recording of that. Because if the core thing is the fact that it's an act and not something you can look at, you shouldn't you know, compromise and do a recording of that. So maybe there are hundreds of incredible artists who are so coherent that never did any recording and we don't know of them, hopefully. <laughs> Uh, your presentation made me think that I always thought about walking as an um, experience of conciliation of the self with surroundings, uh, time, landscape, or city. And uh, in this sense, for instance, uh, I heard recently uh, Ian Sinclair talking about he used to live in East London and have a house in Brighton that is by the sea, and how he always got really confused when he got a train from a place to another, how the time of the two places are so different. London is so fast, everyone walks really, really, really fast, and Brighton is like a relaxed environment. And his way of conciliation, just two different realities, was from walk to one place to another. And um, that seems to be an experience uh, that's present in a lot of the works that you showed. So uh, it's pretty much like a bodily experience. And in this sense, I, I was wondering if you uh, hesitated in put works like um, Sildo Meirelles and Henry Dieterbon, where they send a message across, but it's not a, a bored and self-experience of wandering around, if uh, you question yourself about them. Yes, well, they, they are here because they were in my PhD, basically. <laughs> I, I know it's, it's, a, it's a detour to have those works here. But if you think about the situationist theory of the importance of a detour, I thought they made sense. Because uh, it's fascinating to think how uh, related all the works that deal with movement are. And actually, in, in my PhD, and uh, it might be interesting to, to bring that here, those works are in a chapter which is sort of an intermezzo like here, and which is the, the, um, the works that are not really derived, but that I thought were important to, to be uh, in a discussion on that, because they conceptually they're very close 
like those two pieces we saw, all male art in general could be discussed uh, from the same point of view because it was art that was very coherently used uh, as a mean of producing art that was not um, in the mainstream circuit and that was opposing very often political uh, regimes. And also outdoor art in billboards. This is also an art that uh, in a way supposes a movement from somebody who's seeing all of them. So these are works that immediately don't have anything to do with the, with the derive. But if you start thinking about the way they work and the way they function, what they're suggesting, they do relate. And this is why I wanted to, to bring those two. Because the, the billboards, for example, are also very often uh, very strong political works, like uh, Felix Gonzalez Torres, um, Empty Bed, you might have seen that, or other works, Pierre Huig, showing daily life uh, scenes on billboards. These are all works that, like Sildo Mereles and like all of the derived works, points at ways the society could function, ways that are not uh, measured or ruled by economic, commercial uh, issues of, or ways of considering things. Like, you would never use a billboard to make a very sad and tragic love um, declaration like Felix Gonzalez Torres did. This is something that only art can do. And I think, uh, are you familiar with the work I'm talking about? Yeah. Okay. Are you all? I think you, you all are. Yeah. So this is a way of using uh, a, the most, not the most, but a very expensive uh, mean that the, the commercial, the capitalistic society has to make to, to transmit uh, a message which is in the end very poetic and doesn't bring to nothing, if you want, not from a commercial point of view. And what Sildo is doing is he's doing the same thing. The, the system is so strong that it doesn't even perceive that a message against it is, is circulating by it. So it's, I think, of course, these are not derived in, in a strict sense, but I thought it made sense to insert this small detour in that, you know. Also, maybe because it's a way of suggesting that these issues are not just related to the read themselves. They are present in, in a lot of other works, of course. Oh, just to follow on from that, really, it just got me thinking about Peggy Phelan and her writing on the politics of performance and how within performance you um, really can't capture the essence of it by documenting it and how it's been a perennial problem for people working in performance arts as to how do they then... Um, demonstrate that they've actually done something if it only exists in the present moment. And so she talks about a kind of performative writing. And I was thinking very much of Rancière when you were talking and Rancière's aesthetic regime and the idea of um, parataxic writing as a, a way of phenomenologically presenting yeah. um, embodied lived experience, which seems to be quite... I think, I think Francis Alice touches on it slightly in some of the writing that he does, very much about being in the present and trying to articulate that, but yeah. in, a, in a form that doesn't really follow any conventional style of literature. Yeah. Um, and yeah, and that was just really, I was just following on from the thinking. I don't yeah. know if well, they, yeah, Francis you... Alice is, is very, is an amazing artist, also in his theory. Mm. There is actually a book on, on, on the last piece that we saw, I don't know if you've seen the book. The book is very good. When Fate Moves Mountain, yeah. there's a very good interview with him and Cuauhtémoc Medina, who's the curator who always worked with him. But what's interesting of what you said is that I've, I've read and I went through many histories of performance. Mm -hmm. I don't know why, I mean, I have a few theories on why, but walking is not considered part of the performance art you never find any accounts of walks as performance, performative acts. So this could be, there are a few reasons I can think of. Mainly the performance do have an audience, which is something that doesn't happen with uh, the derive. Mm -hmm. And also the, the performance usually have a theat theatrical uh, take on them. You know, even if it's not normal theater, um, they do have a relation with, with the idea of theater. So this is something that is also not very present in the derive. Um, 
And then there is another thing, which is, I think it's, it's important as well, is that the walking is just a normal act. You know? mm -hmm. This is, for me, the main difference. Like Marina Abramovic, who we just saw, that is actually a very important piece in Marina Abramovic because mm -hmm. uh, when she did, uh, it, it's in a book, I think it's one of the, the, the books she did with Germano Celant, the big one. She talks about this piece and uh, it's now in, in the book she did with the MoMA, the artist is present, it's there for sure. She says that in that piece, and she calls that a performance, was the first performance that she did without an audience. And she felt lost because the audience was not there. So she started doing what you probably have seen, and it's very common for her today, which she called transitory objects. The transitory objects are the objects that somehow transmit to the audience what she did, like the stones, all these objects that is, she actually started creating after that. And it's funny because it's the only walk that she did, and it's the only walk that she did alone, at least for what she says, and she felt the lack of an audience, which is something you would never hear Francis Alice or Richard Long say. Mm -hmm. So it's really a different take on that. And what I think it's interesting is that mainly the performance um, are made by doing some very um, physical, uh, al always, not always, but often painful and very stressing actions. So they are, in a way, and this is not just me saying it, other people say it. There are absurd acts in a way. And I think it's funny that walking, like those artists walk, is also absurd because it doesn't bring to anywhere. And this is really a core thing for, for, the, for most of the Derif. Mm. But I think the fact that what they did, what they do is walking, which is the most normal act we can think of, one of the most normal acts of the everyday life. No? Michel de Certeau talked a lot about walking, for example. This is what makes the Deriv different from the performance art. And this is why it's never considered to be part of the performance history, although it's very clearly a performative act. No? Mm -hmm.